All right, welcome to tonight's webinar with Theaster Gates. And, you know, Theaster has been in Chicago a while, but I mean, he was raised here, but he's been in so many other places and so much traveling. When I talked to him yesterday or the day before, he was in Boston where he's doing a Loeb Fellowship at Harvard University, and today he's in Seattle. And tonight he's doing something with the Joffrey Ballet. And I don't know if you're singing or dancing or just talking or watching. I have no idea. I, I guess where I'd like to start, the Astor, is, you know, I, I guess I'd like to know from how did you go from, how did you get from Lane Tech to the Whitney Biennial to Boston to Seattle? Right. So I, I think um, Lane Tech is a simple one. Uh, in fifth grade, there was a moment where white schools on the north side were busing the best black kids out of black neighborhoods. Um, people who had really good attendance and who, who did well academically. I ended up at a middle school called Riley Elementary. As a result of going to Riley on Belmont and Lawndale, Lane Tech became my local school. So it was a middle school busing opportunity that that then made this better high school on the north side of Chicago um, uh, available to me. And it was only available because there were about five, the five top black kids every year would end up getting exported somewhere else. Now, over the years, that kind of undermined the school because it went from five to 20 to 40, so that the, the best and brightest were always leaving the neighborhood and I think in some ways that's probably a big part of how I think about poor places, poor black places. But after Lane, um, I ended up at Iowa State, studied urban planning, minored in ceramics, studio sculpture, and, and religious studies. And then, um, you know, just kind of wandered through. I got a, a scholarship to go to uh, University of Cape Town through Rotary, Iowa. And I think that it was in it was probably in Cape Town where the idea of kind of internationality and um, an expanded sense of what it meant to live in the world and you know how other people live in the world it just really changed my sense of poverty what I thought poverty was and then what I saw when I went to shanty villages um, you know Google A2 and, you know it was just like a it it, it started to kind of deepen. Um, my sense of like race politics in the states, humanitarian effort, humanity, and then I also hung out with these like Shona sculptors and saw the first hints of like tourist art and um, met some Jewish South African wood firing potters. You know, like ev every everything became like more. Bigger, bigger than I understood it to be. Um, so for about 10 years after that, I, I think I was building a career toward um, a sensitive arts bureaucrat, that I would be a policy guy for cities, and I'd be the go-to guy for artists if they wanted to do public art projects. Um, I ended up writing public art policy for um, the Chicago Transit Authority so that the blue line and the red line and the brown line, these these train train um, these these kind of rail systems that move through different parts of the city. For those of you who aren't in, who aren't in Chicago, that as they got reconstructed, funds would be set aside for public art. Anyway, the more I did that bureaucratic stuff, um, I became a good bureaucrat and a good kind of hustler. But I also like learned a lot about materials and materiality and how to stage big things for other artists. What, what year are we talking about, roughly? Um, I, I started at CTA around 2000 and left in 20, 2005. OK. Um, would you have called, in, in 2000, 2001, two in there, would you have called yourself an artist, or you would have called yourself, that wasn't how you defined yourself primarily yet, was it? I called myself a potter Yeah. with a day job. Okay. Which which seemed like everybody else in my life that I had access to were uh, interesting people who had an art practice and kept a day job. 
can do it, which for some, that would make me a hobbyist. Right. You know, um, but I, I actually took clay pretty seriously. And then on the side, I would help my dad. Hey, Mary. On the side, I would help my dad. Uh, he was a roofer, so we would build buildings and uh, rehab. So I had the set of skills, but the set of skills, I never used them uh, in my art practice um, because potters are potters, you know, and you, you do that thing. Around 2005, um, I started thinking maybe I could think about bigger projects for myself and um, maybe uh, uh, I'm not using my skills best by working for the Chicago Transit Authority that it felt like I was shutting down bus routes in Mexican and Puerto Rican and black communities and, and rebuilding the pink line and the brown line that would like take people further north. And I was like, well, if, if I'm only getting a, a check, couldn't I get a check somewhere else where I'm actually impacting in a good way the you know, people who really need it, right? At the same time, I was asking this question about my art, like could art be a way that I could start to talk about some of the politics and forces in the city um, uh, um, in the absence of having money, um, can I do a gestural thing that would help people understand some of these things that I see every day? Uh, the lack of education, the lack of food, uh, food, food resources, whether they're grocery stores or restaurants, healthy options. Um, and I didn't want to just keep saying, you know, black people are fat or America is fat. It's like, how do we, how do we activate that? So I, I, I thought Clay was, I was running up to a point where I was as good as I was going to be as a potter. <laughs> and um, Clay was starting to feel like a limiting material. So I just kind of expanded it, started like having these large dinners where I would make the pots and then, the, you know, the dinner would be the social conversation. And then it was just. When was that? Is that like 2005? I remember you and I met in the fall 2004. Yep. You know, with, with Lynn Besa, who talked to this group earlier. And yep. then I remember seeing a show of yours, I think, at the Southside Community Arts Center. Or yep. I had a show at the High Park Arts Center in 07. No, this was before that and further south. Then it was it was the High Park Art. It was um, probably the High Park, the Southside Community Arts yeah, Center. Yeah, I think it was. Um, okay, and then you start, so, all right, so then you started using clay as a social medium, kind of, right? Yeah. Okay. But all along, I felt like the material, like, I felt like a conceptual dude who happened to be a potter, you know? And so I was going to use clay conceptually, um, but the material was really distracting for, say, folk who lived in the contemporary art scene or whatever. So I was just kind of convening these dinners and stuff, not necessarily trying to like make a name in the art world, but just because I was a potter and this was one way that I could communicate effectively, you know. Okay. Um, it, it started to feel around 2006, six seven like I had this um, expanded community of people who I was good friends with, but I never cashed in on the resources that they were. like. You know, they knew a lot about building materials, or they were great welders, or they were art historians or curators, but they never, you know, they never really thought of me as an artist, and I never really thought about meeting them. And it wasn't until 2007 when I had this show at the Hyde Park Art Center where I convened 50 people um, under an alias called Yamaguchi, this, this kind of mythic black Japanese character who I used to start to ask questions about soul food and ceremony. It wasn't until then that I thought, well, maybe there's a way that I could have an expanded art practice that was actually a professional art practice that I might even want to uh, imagine that I'm, a, I'm an artist with lots to say about the city and um, that the art world might imagine that in a very legible way. So I think over the last four years then, um, 
I've worked harder and harder to just do the things that I do, but with sensitivity to um, an art lens, and then with a disregard to the to the art gaze. So doing things in neighborhoods and just doing them quietly until they can't be quiet anymore, and then you know, people find. Do you want to show about. some pictures? Do you want to discuss that you know a little bit more explicitly? I think that's yeah. really interesting because I, I gotta I gotta hand over to you. I don't think that's the normal career path, you know, and I don't know that there is a normal necessarily, and I don't know that there has to be a normal, but. Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm excited to know more about the team of folks that are that are here online with us, because maybe none of us are really normal. We're all just trying to figure out ways that we could, like, boot, bootstrap a practice, and um, and so, you know, that's what I think I'm that's what I think I've been trying to do, and I still feel that way. I don't feel like I've figured it out just because there's been a couple museum opportunities. Um, let's see here. Can you guys see that? Can Can you see that? Yeah, did you click on share your desktop? Let me try to do that. Yeah, sometimes there's a bit of lag and it takes a moment, but it usually works. Okay. It's happening. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about it with, with two projects, maybe. Um, the first, uh, Around 2008, a guy named Ken Dunn, who's, you know, the master of recycled material in Chicago, um, he, uh, sim he gave me a call and said, Theasha, I have these wooden boards. Um, you want to come look at them? I've had them for a while. They're, they're from, uh, they were conveyor pallets at Wrigley's Chewing Gum in the neighborhood where you grew up. You should take them. Uh, so I went and looked at them, and they were really cool modular units. And I was like, oh, man, this is like, you know, this is like a throwback to, to, to you know, minimalism or like Carl Andre or Judd. These are really beautiful. Let me do something with them. So because there were no um, art opportunities available to me, um, you know, museums weren't asking me to do things or whatever, I, I decided that I would rent a small space in Pilsen or a big space in Pilsen and build my own uh, – exhibition with its, you know, I would, I would name the space and um, have office hours, and then I would be the artist, you know, and it was all this kind of mythic hoopla around these set of wear boards. And so um, on the right, you see this um, little space that I created that I call Temple Number One. And the temple was basically using these wear boards as many ways as I could um, to create this very minimalist kind of uh, sacred space. After I created the space, um, I thought, man, I, somebody needs to perform in it. And so I decided that I, I would create a small music ensemble that I called the Black Monks of Mississippi and, and that this group would uh, process through the space and then um, sit in the space and uh, sing and chant and moan um, with particular references to soul, gospel, and blues. That it, that it would be a, a kind of black chant, uh, that monasticism would, would get filtered, would, would be the filter for um, the music of black people. Um, when I posted meditation hours on the door, people came. They came with their yoga mats. They came, you know, wanting, wanting a yogic, psychic experience. And so, you know, like a good performer, I, just, I gave it to them. I just <laughs> give it out. You know, you're like, you know, what do yogis do? Let me try to do that and do it better than yogis, you know. And so we ended up coming with a, a, a kind of black, I'm calling it, I'm, I'm using the word black, like, like a soul chant. And, um, and then 
people were really confused and they would come in and they'd be like, well, what faith is this? Or what, what are you, what are you guys? And, you know, I said, you know, we're just people interested in um, activating spaces and, and making up shit, you know? <laughs> um, and so, and so that then allowed, Hey there, that then allowed for a series of conversations about what does it mean? What is sacred space and all that. But that was also the moment when I shifted from just using clay to using another material. Immediately at that point, some curators from the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago um, said, you know, could you build a version of the temple in, the, in our museum? And so I said, well, instead of building a temple inside of the temple, could I uh, take over the museum space, converting it into my, my you know, temple number two? Um, so they said yes, and, and I ended up having the show. And by then, the black monks were like eight months old, and we were like bad. We were like the Beatles, you know. It was like, <laughs> you know, we had this following, and, and it ended up that this was the first time that the MCA had allowed for a full-on performance and audience to happen inside of the gallery, right? And so, in a way, part of part of what I'm suggesting is that the first opportunity. I had to make it up myself, which led to people seeing the work and then saying, would you consider doing this? And, and you know, I financed it. It ended up being like $4,000, and these dinners were expensive, so I would, like, save up money and ask people for money, you know. Who 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 saw you from the MCA? How did you get on their radar? Um, I, I think that Trisha Van Eck had been okay. checking out the work for a while. Trisha spoke to us earlier on in this program, you know, and yeah. I, I think she's wonderful, but, I, I, you know, the key point here is that, that you took the initiative and you did something, you know, maybe spontaneous, but also intelligent, and from that guts ball, other opportunities emerged. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's exactly the point I'm making now, that that um, if, if I had to do a fair amount of um, shifting people's perception of what I had to offer, and for so long, I had been a bureaucrat for so long or, or an arts administrator for so long, if you will, that um, it was really, it's even hard now for people to like um, imagine being an arts administrator as part of an artistic skill set, but not being the only thing you do. You know, it was just like, you know, it was, it was the skill set that helped me pay the bills, but all along I was still thinking about big ideas. And yeah, so... Okay. You know, and so we we um we staged a series of performances, and this was when I really started to feel like my my exhibition interest and in, in, in uh, object making interest started to um, conflate with my interest in performance. Uh, um, that it gave me a plat a new kind of platform to marry these things that had often been two separate spheres of my artistic life. Um, that I would go to the Velvet Lounge, this jazz spot, and hang out with the jazz cats or the spoken word scene. But that was very, very different from what felt like a kind of largely white contemporary art scene or a largely white craft scene at Little Street Art Center or wherever. That I, I had these two lives, and they were racialized, and they were geographied, and they were on different parts, you know, different parts of the city. But as a result of the then MCA show, and, and that was in 2009, 10, or 2000, yeah, just on the cusp of 2009. Um, uh, the, Whitney Bi the Whitney Biennial was, was coming up, and um, Francesco Bonomi, the curator for the Biennial, um, had heard that I was doing these large performances and connecting different parts of the city, um, and that I could do it on a shoestring budget and have a lot of impact. And, uh, you know, the, the Whitney um, uh, needed something to happen in the courtyard and asked me if there was a way that I could then move this material again um, to, to convert the, the courtyard. And I, I said, yeah, I'd love to. And I ended up um, converting the courtyard into this kind of um, more expanded monastic temple 
that was dedicated to shining shoes. Um, that, that like a shoe shine stand. I mean, we need to be literal here, I think. Yeah. So I'll, I'll try to find one for you. These are, these are the eventual iconic shoe shine stands, but I, I wanted to have a poetic about, um, you know, these museums were starting to ask me to do things, and they were big cultural institutions, but I wanted to figure out a way to get them in conversations with other cultural institutions in other parts of the city that were maybe equally important to me, but lesser known. And in parts of the racialized city that people of culture don't normally go to. And so that began the kind of urban planner artist thing, where I was really interested in traversing parts of the city um, um, and getting other people to go with me to different parts of the city um, where culture happens. So if in the museum all I can do is point at culture, I wanted to send people where I was pointing. Right? And so this is a, a an image of me shining a guy's shoes at Little Black Pearl Art Center on the south side of the city. Little Black Pearl, an amazing cultural institution that uh, maybe the cultural elite that are trustees to the Museum of Contemporary Art um, uh, had never been to. So I thought, well, if I invited them, and because my show is at the MCA and I had this other show um, at Little Black Pearl that happened simultaneously, that maybe they would become more interested in what happens at Little Black Pearl, you know. So it was like I was starting to do this other kind of con kind of connection work, but like a, a way of leveraging the moment for more than just um, the exhibition of my work to start to bring communities of people together who, and, and, and politically and economically bring resources to places where people could say, oh my God, I didn't know this was here, we should be supported. You know, so it was, it was like my own little politic of geography. Um, I also wanted to kind of complicate how people perceive black neighborhoods. That, that when you say I live in an all black neighborhood, Rarely do you, you know, and, and so like thinking about how commerce works and, and who owns the corner store and who owns the cafes and who owns the dry cleaners, I wanted to complicate race, that it ain't a black and white city, that in my neighborhood, the thing next to Shine King is a, is a barbecue restaurant owned by Chinese people, right? And so how do I start to like bring bring those cultural conflations to bear um, in places where you think that the only thing that happens is that, you know, black people shoot up or whatever. I wanted to, and I didn't want it to be a black-white binary. I wanted it to be, I wanted a complicated city, you know, and I think that Chicago, less, less than, uh, like, less than New York, you know, things ain't real mixed up, but there are these moments where interesting things happen. So, you know, at the barbecue pit, you can also send a fax. You might be able to play the lottery. You, there's an ATM in there. Like these become the moments where this this is the closest I get to Whole Foods. <laughs> you know, that that um, I wanted to reference um, shoe shining in the black church. I wanted to bring black church members in there with their shiny shoes and their fancy hats. I wanted one temple to make room for, for um, contemporary art culture and um, contemporary black culture, you know, religious culture, um, Buddhist culture, you know, um, hip hop culture, you know. So this, this space ended up by virtue of whatever the monks were doing from free week to free week, bringing these new audiences of people in museums get really excited. So um, there were also some things inside these materials that started to become like more poetic, you know, like that were just, you know, that, that they weren't always about race. They were also just about ritual and uh, kind of the history of doing things. So when some people would look at the shoe shine brushes and the wax, they'd be like, oh, my God, I used to shine my dad's shoes every week. 
or, you know, when I was in the military, I did thus and so, so that it, it went from this, like, strange racialized object, the shoe shine stand, and these hierarchies of black and white, to really personal narratives that were actually really positive, and beautiful. That how do you get a set of materials that activate everybody's imaginations for very different reasons? Uh, and so I found myself, Paul, really wanting to move between museum action and then action outside of the museum. Right. Um, and so I would I would try to get to the museum as often as possible to like go back to my neighborhood to to engage with me in things to the point where I needed I didn't need any longer the validation of museums to go with me. I would just do shit on my own. You know, so it's like I'm going to start making cultural institutions in my place, in, in my neighborhood, because if not, I'm going to end up always having to go downtown or up north. Have you read Diane Graham's book, Producing Local Color? No. It's fabulous. She looks at, it's, I think it's her doctoral dissertation out of the University of Chicago, and now she's a professor at Tulane, but she looked at um, Bronzeville for everybody, you know, which is a predominantly black community on the south side of Chicago. And Pilsen, which despite its Germanic name, is a predominantly a Hispanic community a little bit west of Bronzeville and Andersonville in the north. And mm -hmm. one of her points is, very clearly is, is that in most cities, and in particular like Chicago, the downtown institutions are homogenized, white, northern European, you know, extraction kinds of aesthetics and philosophies. But that so much of what goes on that's really valuable is out in the communities. Yeah. You know, you know Patrick McCoy, right? And, oh, yeah, and you know, well. Patrick has a collection of maybe five, six hundred works of art. Eighty percent of them Absolutely. are from people in the Black Bronzeville community, and he's right. buying art because it speaks to himself and to his heritage, but also because it's a means of activating and giving back, you know, to the community. I think it's brilliant, you know. And I, yeah. I'm get, you know, I'm getting that our new mayor is picking up on some of this stuff, and I'm really optimistic <laughs> that we're going to see more decentralization of the arts, you know, in line with the things that you, Fiasco, are talking about. Yeah, that, that I, I think it is a funny moment where um, if you have a courageous thought that happens, you know, inside or outside of a formal institution, you just do it. You just do it. And, you know, and you have these new mechanisms like Kickstarter where you can, like, have a project and invite people in to help you out you know, that, that if I were to ask myself um, what's at stake in, in being an artist, most of it is I want to make my work. I want the respect of my, my peers, um, a little bit of shine every once in a while, and somebody to smile or a pretty girl or a nice guy say, Fiesta, I, I, heard that, I heard you give that talk. That was really nice. Please come to my you know, gallery opening. That, like, that kind of like shared comradeship is really important. And then you want to make some money if you can. But if that's the case, there are so many ways you can do that, and you, you don't necessarily need to do it with a museum, you know. And so, like, what are the other venues for cultural production that could be equally satisfying, equally, and that could take advantage of the big city, you know, the, the, the places in addition to large cultural institutions. And so I think, you know, that's what I've been trying to do. So the, the image that's up now is um, the Milwaukee Art Museum asked me to do a show about a slave potter named Dave. Um, I wanted to connect Dave to um, uh, craft labor in Wisconsin. And so I ended up spending a lot of time at the Kohler Manufacturing Corporation and working with a group of union ceramic, uh, like mold makers and casters to make a new body of sinks that, that performed as speakers. And in addition, um, I ended up creating a, a gospel choir that um, um, would then sing um, hymns that me and a guy named Leroy Bach co-composed. Um, that, Those things are profoundly beautiful. You know, the music that was performed at uh, the Milwaukee Art Museum, that, that's wonderful. Thank you, thank you man. And, and I thought, you know, we have about 15 minutes, so I thought I'd just leave you guys with a couple of videos 
that, that can just shortly show you, one, the creative activation of space in my neighborhood. Um, that was like the space where these um, um, uh, choir rehearsals would happen as I was preparing for my show at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Uh, but it also ended up creating this alternative venue where um, new music could be explored and people could convene. Um, almost kind of being the first music venue in this part of the South Side in the last 20 years, which is this irony. Um, Paul, you may want to you might want to say some things before I uh, shift to some videos. I don't know. I mean, I'd like to see the videos, but I'm also assuming if you well. If you, I don't know, maybe we want to let some people ask some questions, too. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, do you have to leave in 15 minutes? Is that what it comes well, down to? I don't have to? to leave immediately, but it'll be, uh, you know, about 10 minutes after the hour. All right, well, let's see if we can maximize all your time, and why don't we take 10 minutes for questions right now and see how far that goes, and then go to the videos, okay? Sounds good. So to do that, you should give me back control, Okay. Okay. And you have to go up to the top center, I think, and then, you know, maybe you're I there. Think I, do I assign it? Yeah, I don't know. I think. I don't think it's typing. I think it's, there you go. You did it. All right. Um, you guys can, I'm going to unmute everybody because it's quicker, and then we're going to have an echo, and I'm going to have to mute all of you except the person speaking. But who would like to ask the ask for something? Jacobina wants to know if you still have a day job. Oh, nice question. I, I, um, I do. Hold on a second, Fiesta. Let me mute it. Hold on one sec. Let me mute everybody and then unmute you, okay? I'm sorry, because it makes it more efficient this way. And, okay, you can go ahead. Thank you. Jacobina? She can't. She's muted now. Okay. Yeah, so, yes, I do have a day job. I'm still... Um, at the University of Chicago, um, the title is Director of Arts Programming Development, which means I help people, I help the provosts um, uh, think about how money gets spent and how new programs are created um, on and off campus for the University of Chicago. Um, the other part of my title is Artist in Residence. And what's cool about this dual title is that it um, it gives value to my life as a researching and practicing maker. Uh, so this last year, I had the privilege of being um, in the Graduate School of Design at Harvard, kind of thinking about um, culture in micro businesses. Um, when I go back to, to Chicago, to the University of Chicago, uh, my job will be thinking about activating some of the spaces um, that we have um, like kind of unused commercial spaces that the University of Chicago owns in ways that we may, might be able to activate them using the arts, right? So um, this, this slippery slope is like now maybe where I don't necessarily have to work, I still feel like there's some value in the institutional association that allows me to be impactful in a way that I couldn't had I not be had I not been uh, connected to the university. So I'm really, I'm actually really excited to keep my day job. But because of the schedule now with, with all these new art opportunities, it's meant that I've had to compensate in other ways. And so um, my shop has grown, like people who help me. And then um, um, the way that I split my time between the university and my art practice, that's gonna be a kind of ongoing conversation between me and the university. Are you making money on the sale of individual objects and on these performance environmental engagement activation pieces? Or, I mean, you know, what, or are they a vehicle to add legitimacy to your individual pieces? Um, the, the art objects make money and the performances um, make money. Uh, they're different scales. I, I think that the art objects live in the realm of the imaginary. Um, the, 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 the value of them uh, has increased o over the last couple of years, where the art performances are really about how do we create um, 
moments where other amazing musicians get paid their value, you know. And so and so those are like gigs, but they're good gigs. And right now we just gig in like museums and in special spaces. Um, so they serve each other. They serve each other. Yeah, they're and they're often a museum will invite me to do um, an installation and then ask me to to activate it. Okay, Christopher has a question. Let me unmute Christopher. And Christopher, ask you, go ahead, ask your question. There you go. Yep. Hey, Theaster. Hey, man. Uh, we, when we started out the course, one of the questions that Paul asked us is, uh, why do you do the artwork that you do? And I'm I'm curious about that, and I'm I'm curious about what effect you are hoping that your, your uh, creative expression will have. Why? Um, maybe I can talk about the affect first. <laughs> um, I live where I live. Um, it's an arbitrary place. It was, the, it was the place that I could afford when I started working at University of Chicago. Um, it's the hood. What I really wanted to happen was the, the now this was five years ago, that my life as a kind of weirdo, eccentric dude could have some positive impact on the built environment in my neighborhood. Over the last couple of years, Chris, other people have started to believe that the work that I'm doing in that neighborhood has value. And they're like, how can we share our resources with you because we believe in the work that you're doing? So like, if I lived uh, in, a, in a downtown condominium, there would be no work to do except by maybe being secretary of my condominium board. But because of the like location uh, of my practice, which now doesn't feel arbitrary, it feels really intentional, um, the effect has been that um, if an, if an artist could have as much or more impact on a city as an urban planner, as a developer, as a wealthy person, that if we think not only about our own individual practices but about the people around us, if that's your practice, that that could have really amazing consequence. No, and, and it was having consequence when nobody knew me as an artist, and I was just the weirdo neighbor who mowed everybody's lawn, and now when other people want to help out. So, so I think the effect that I hope is that more artists would feel like we're some badass, powerful people, right? Um, but the why art and the what art, I think that in some ways I'm really still kind of figuring that out. Like, uh, when I when I was a potter exclusively and really connected to the craft community, what I felt, you know, I'm, I'm from a pretty religious background, but what I loved about ceramics was that it had rules and that it had like do's and don'ts, and and that there was this whole history that then connected me to all these other people who were also part of the same. That there was a way that like I really liked being associated with a group. You know what I mean? It's kind of funny. And um, ceramics had an orthodoxy, which was like, you know, craft has an orthodoxy. And so I was really excited about that. But now I think um, using, like, I feel like um, art gives me an opportunity to ask questions about these really specific moments that happen in cities that I may, may not have uh, the power to change because of money or political influence, I feel like I can be as important an agent of change through my art practice. And, and it's, it's, it's moving more and more toward what are the challenges of the city, what are the history of challenges in the city, and, and how can my art practice like um, collide and collapse um, so that, like here in Seattle, my, Mark Dion is doing a lot of work with um, kind of reimagining um, the Puget Sound. How can artists play a role in actually changing the physical built environment? You know, so that you move from like your individual studio to a gallery to the house museum to the city. 
and I like I like that scaling that you can like you know move between scales, right? So I don't I'm not really interested in a, a material specificity or like I'm not out to lick painting or that maybe even my investment in objects is secondary to um, my curiosity and concern about um, the neglect that cities have given certain neighborhoods, blight. I think I can eradicate blight. I'm going to try to eradicate blight, you know. That's fabulous. You are so, can I swear, you're so fucking inspirational. I think this is just really, really, and I think it's totally doable. You know, and part of what I tell the people in this class is to dream big, you know, and have big yeah. visions. Yeah. And, you know, I think that and the visions distinguish you from, you know, the other folks. And, yeah. you know, you're living proof of that. Well, you know, um, so, I mean, but it, it's like when I say I want to eradicate blight, the way I started with that was one $15,000 abandoned building. That, you, that you, don't, you don't get overwhelmed by the eradication of blight. That has to then turn into moments where shit happens. Exactly. And so it's like before I could even buy the $15,000 building, I borrowed the money from my mama. Before I could do that, I was making little clay houses, hundreds of them, and inviting people to um, come to my little exhibition and buy a little clay house for a dollar because that's what buildings were being sold at. Like, it, would, it moved from gestural moments until I could have a real impact on a real place. That's fabulous. I'm ready to watch the videos unless you want to take more yeah, questions. Yeah, let's do it. All, All right, right, I'm going to give you back the control. Here. Hold on a I love you, Mary Brugger. I love you, Mary. I love you, Mary. There's three Marys, right? Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Hello, the after. Hi. Hi. Come to L.A., the after. Come to L.A. <laughs> you guys got to, like, email me. This is so fucking awesome. It's hot, oh. isn't it? You're a Thank genius. You, yeah, right. <laughs> I learned it all from you. My goodness. I'm going to share my desktop. Um, I don't know how you make those words sound so beautiful in music. Oh, man. Oh, Paul. <laughs> Slideshow. Okay. Can you see that now? Yes. So I'm going to run through these. So everybody, I'm just going to um, show. Uh, so this is one of the, the sinks that normally this would this sink it's a little bit weird and muted and um, deformed from the firing. Um, there was a moment where this white union worker said, um, because because of his relationship to color, you know, theaster. Sometimes I feel like a nigger. And I thought it was so interesting that this this white union worker knew he knew that his job was going to be eradicated in a couple of years and go somewhere else. That that like not even the German descendants of the original German Kohler factory workers were safe from globalized corporate familial wealth. That when a union when a white pop belly union worker from Kohler, Wisconsin, can say, sometimes I feel like a nigger too. Um, I feel like art is really doing something. And there was a way in which I think that, that um, over the years, we've been way more concerned about fresh catfish than uh, the niggers who fish for it, if you will. And so this was like this really wonderful rub up, you know, this moment where me and the factory workers at Kohler had this amazing set of things in common. Um, these are also the kind of byproduct objects that um, kind of circulate and allow me to be in this conversation with the history of art. Um, I just wanted to show you guys this. This is this is the room. Um, uh, this is Dr. Wax, a, a, an album. Dr. Wax is a music store. Um, in Hyde Park, Chicago, that went out of business because they, they, the brother couldn't afford the rent anymore. And um, he was starting to sell the albums like a dollar a pop. 
And I said, man, you know, we should really turn this into like a listening archive or something. You know, like, can you, would you consider selling all the albums? So we worked out this deal. So now one of the, what was an abandoned building is now um, a listening, a listening archive of soul, gospel, blues, and jazz. Um, this is also the space where the, the, uh, the Facebook choir that I put together for the Milwaukee Art Museum, this is where we rehearsed. I can see you and hear you, yeah. <clears throat> um, that that the reason I wanted to kind of end with those was because part I was asked to do an exhibition because these people knew that I was a potter and and because I was black um, and to be crude, crass. Um, but I think what I wanted to propose was that there was a way in which um, the creation of a body of music um, about a slave potter named Dave. Um, and rehearsing that music over the course of a year um, and then uh, creating an opportunity for that stuff to live in a museum, that those rehearsals were acts of ceramic production to me. That, th that there's a way that, like, say, bringing my full self to the table, not just my potter self or my roofer self or my black self, that when all those <laughs> things are together, um, there's, there's room to have a more complicated conceptual work, like, in the, in, um, yeah. Cool. Can you give me um, back control, Theaster? Yes. Or did you want to show something else? No, I'm done. All right. Now, is, uh, the, the sound quality was compromised because it's coming out of your speakers into the microphone and then to oh. us. And I know that the Milwaukee thing is on um, YouTube. Is yeah. Is it, are other things there too? If we look up the Astro Gates on YouTube, we can find a variety of things. Yeah, yeah. There's um, the Milwaukee thing is profoundly beautiful. I think. And yeah, if, if you Google Shine King, Shine um, King. Yeah, Shine King is is the shoe shine place. That that narrative also comes up. It's some, some really beautiful singing. A couple of uh, talks will come up. 
But can I take anymore. another question? And Dana wanted to yeah. say something. Dana, just wait a minute. I'm going to unmute Dana because she wants to say something directly. Okay. Dana, take it away. I just wanted to say hello to the Aster. Dana. Oh, my baby. <laughs> How you doing? Hey, keep it clean here, all right? This is public. <laughs> oh, my God. No, no. no I just wanted to say, I didn't know. I just wanted to say that I got, I got a message this afternoon from one of the students in Charlotte. So mm. inspired. And they said, oh, it's the Aster back in town. Oh. I don't, I don't know where he is, but wherever he oh. is, he's happening. Oh, thank you so much, Dana. Next time in, next time in Chicago, forever. Yeah, we're okay. going to hook it up. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let me unmute. You guys are great. Let me unmute Eric. Eric, did you did you have a question, Eric? Oh, uh, yeah, well, I just wanted to say hello to Theaster. I think we went to Lane at the same time. Yeah, I graduated. Eric, where are you? Um, where hey, are you? we did. <laughs> How are you, man? Good. Um, Good. I, 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 everything that uh, that I've seen tonight has been really beautiful and wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. I would love to email you sometime and, and share. Oh, cool. So, uh, Paul, can I give everybody my email address? Yeah, go right ahead, and I'll you know, and then I'll send them a follow up, and I'll send. I mean, this is recorded, and I will send you. To, you know, I'll send that, and I'll yeah. send the link to some of the uh, YouTube things to you and everybody else, but go ahead and give it out and I'll repeat right. it later. My my email is uh, theaster at uchicago.edu. That's the one I use the most. And, and um, I'm on Facebook and we can, friend, we can Facebook each other and stuff like that. But I think it's really like, uh, if you reference this conversation, that'd be good, just so I have some context. And right now, like say it's, it's become more and more busy because I feel like museums have this problem of like, they don't feel relevant and they're trying to figure out how do we stay part of the full life of the city. And so they're having more and more to find these renegade programs, these renegade projects. And it's like, never have I felt more confident that the things that are happening at the margins of um, high culture is the best shit ever. You know, and then, like, we should all just, you know, whatever we're on, just, like, stay on it. And that you, that, that the beauty is that, say, I'm 37 now, and I've, I've been making since I was 22, that um, for the 15 to 17 years, I wasn't preoccupied with, like, not being a part of some art world thing. I was just kind of doing my thing, you know? And it allowed me this kind of slow maturity, I feel. And now it feels like, oh, yeah, um, that person is a good person. I want to work with them. Or this is not a good opportunity because it don't feel right. I ain't going to do it. But, you know, that there's still – and then there's still, like, my desire to continue to do things on my block because that's where it's happening, you know. So I just wanted to say that to you guys, like, you know, it, now now that there are new options, I feel like I'm still going back to the things that have always been there, like, you know, people who have always been dear to me and stuff like that. Yeah, Astor, I think this has been fabulous. I think you add, you know, some perspective to, you know, the, the relationship between microcosm and macrocosm yeah. and, you know, th thinking globally and acting locally, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and just the wealth of possibilities and how, you know, putting yourself out there has a strong likelihood of paying off. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you, too. This has been fabulous. Have a great time in Seattle. Let's grab some lunch when you're back, okay? Sounds good. Bye, everybody. Right, thank you, everybody. Bye. And I'm going to stop this recording right now. Thank you, Theaster. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.